Okay, so we have uh, Yasu Fink. Uh, are you coming to us from Minnesota? I'm sorry? Are you coming to us from Minnesota? Yes, I am. Okay, well, welcome. I will advance your slides for you as you go through. Uh, if you just give me uh, an indication of where you're at. Um, and all right, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, I would have loved to be uh, at this conference, but uh, as you might have heard, uh, I was not quite prepared for the strange world in which we are living today, in which even Canada and European Union puts travel restrictions between their citizens. Um, so I couldn't make it. Um, but um, today I would like to talk a little bit about the work of Tatjana Inunfest Anasheva, uh, who is somewhat not as well known uh, in the thermodynamics community as she deserves to be. And I would like to uh, draw attention to some of the things that she did in the foundations of thermodynamics that are still uh, very relevant, I think, to today's philosophical discussions uh, in the philosophy of physics. So can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, I will concentrate on two things, two parts of the talk. First of all, I will want to talk about her treatment of reversible processes. And this is more or less uh, inspired by John Norton's recent discussions that the term, the term reversible process is actually a contradiction in terms. He claims that it is inconsistent and therefore forms a, an example of what he calls ideas, that is, things that you have a verbal description, but no consistent mathematical model. Um, when he started writing claims like that, I pointed him to the work of Irem uh, Festa van de Sheva, which I think has already addressed and solved that problem. Uh, uh, and so he did give a discussion of her work in his paper, uh, but I was unable to convince him uh, he thinks that if Best Anishay's work is as confused as uh, all the rest of the work that he criticizes. I want to explain why I do not fall in line with that illusion and uh, point out the similarities actually of the solution that she presents and the claims that uh, Norton is making. The second part of my talk uh, will discuss an earlier work of her uh, from 1925 and I'll pick out uh, her introduction of a special axiom in her treatment of thermodynamics, the axiom of thermal coupling, and uh, want to point out why that axiom is there and it is meant as an illustration of how original her thinking in the foundations of thermodynamics actually was. So, can I have the next slide? So, to start out with that discussion of reversible processes, one might simply ask, what is a reversible process in thermodynamics? And there is a long and convoluted history of the need for process to be reversible. I have written about that in uh, a long paper I wrote a long time ago about love you waking to uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, but I'll skip most of that discussion uh, and concentrate on what come to you today, uh, which is more or less standard, is that the reversible process is described by some smooth curve in an equilibrium state space for any, any thermodynamic system. So for example, for a fluid, 
uh, the most common state space is the PD diagram, and uh, what you see in the picture below is a representation of the Carnot cycle, cyclic process, which consists of a series of such smooth curves. Uh, the reason why these curves are called reversible is the intuition that you can run that process in both directions. And uh, so, for example, for the Carnot cycle, if you run it in one direction, it's the heat engine. If you run it in the opposite direction, it will act as a refrigerator. And of course, most of those instantiations are used in uh, the Carnot theory uh, led to the birth of thermodynamics. So it's actually a quite ancient idea, uh, and it's absolutely crucial to the development of thermodynamics. Um, can I next slide? Okay. Uh, if you are used to that way of thinking, uh, it's somewhat of a surprise to hear that the concept of reversible processes would be inconsistent, because absolutely there's nothing inconsistent about such curves in state space, and uh, we all know very well how to describe them, for example, by differential equipments. Well, the problem is, uh, in what sense does such a curve represent process? By definition, an equilibrium state, that is the points in those equilibrium state space, are states that will remain unchanged in time as long as the system is undisturbed. So in order to change the state of the system, to get it from one equilibrium state to the next, you will have to disturb the system. But as soon as you disturb the system, it's not any longer going to be in equilibrium. And so its state is not going to be represented in that equilibrium space. So as Norman puts it, uh, if the system is equilibrium or it is not, it can be both. Either a system undergoes change or it does not. It cannot do both. And so here is a uh, very succinct uh, summary of what the inconsistency is about. To um, illustrate that with a more mundane concept, uh, for example, suppose you want to move a cup that is being filled to the brim, uh, for example, of a delicious cappuccino, uh, and want to move it without spilling it. Well, a moment's reflection uh, will show you that it cannot be done if it is literally filled to the brim, because as soon as you try to move it, you will have to exert force on it. Uh, if you exert a force, the liquid will respond by uh, wave motion, and then come on the some of it will spill over the, the edge. Uh, so it's an example of another impossible process. Can I have the next slide? Now the way people usually address that problem is more about that. Just like how you would try to do if you want to put your cup in cup, namely, you try to see as delicate and slowly as you possibly can. And so, the standard textbooks that talk about processes proceed very, very slowly or even infinitely slowly to take Planck's technology, or by just using infinitesimal disturbances. Now, Norton is quite right that all of these accounts that you find in standard textbooks and other texts are usually sloppy, informable, and uh, more intuitive. 
Uh, there is more careful attempt in Theodori's work, uh, and to be somewhat brief, uh, what he skews in that work is that the coordinates that define state space can be divided into two kinds, one of which is of deformation coordinates, the other ones of thermal coordinates. And the idea is that these deformation coordinates um, retain their definition even if the system is not equilibrium. While a thermal coordinate is, in, in essence, a uh, equilibrium parameter that might not be, be defined so to be somewhat more concrete, uh, you can think of the volume of the system. Even if the system is not a equilibrium, it does have a volume if it's contained in a container. Uh, and you can think of changing those uh, coordinates during a process in which the system doesn't need to be in equilibrium. Now, all those deformation coordinates collectively x, and assume that you can describe, prescribe a particular path in time from initial values of those coordinates to some final coordinates, and presume that you take the system along that path in a way in which the velocity of the change of those deformation coordinates will vanish uniformly uh, integrated over time. That limit, which the philosophies finish in the end, uh, is what Kakek calls quasi-static process. That, as I uh, said, uh, is today almost regarded as synonymous to universal. Uh, there is some more work to be done to recover the thermal coordinates in the initial and state, but I'll skip the technical stuff. Um, but I just wanted to point out that that is the most formal and precise description that was available at the time in the early 20th century. Uh, as you will see, in all of those cases, whether they're formal or informal, uh, the term reversible process actually implies the limit of uh, what is actually the sequence of processes. Um, and to remind you of another theme that Norton is always keen to point out, if you have a limit of things, uh, then that limit might not actually be a thing of the same kind as taking limits up. So that's important to keep in mind. It's, of course, very familiar to anybody who has uh, studied the notions of sequences and limits in mathematics. Um, but it sometimes tends to be forgotten. So let me now turn to the next slide and talk about Tatjana uh, Afankeva, who was famously married to Paul Ehrenfest, and they did a lot of job work together, which made statistical mechanics. But she also wrote works on her own, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, a paper that she wrote in 1925 on the axiomatization of the second thermodynamics. And 30 years later, she elaborated her views in a booklet of foundations of thermodynamics, uh, which, as they said, seems to be almost forgotten, but is actually a gem of uh, original insight. Uh, although work thermodynamics are somewhat few and far between, uh, she did have a much stronger general influence uh, in the Leiden community of physicists, 
uh, in particular on uh, Geertruyn and the Haas Lopens, who was Lopens's daughter, uh, and also married to another physicist, the Haas. But she was also a competent physicist by herself, and wrote a book on uh, the two laws of thermodynamics in Dutch uh, in the 1940s. Another example uh, is Philip Goldstein, who is the co-author with uh, Van der Waals of a book, textbook on thermodynamics, first appeared in 1908, uh, and was called Leben der Dynamik in German. Um, and it's quite interesting that 1928, uh, when the Van der Waals was already dead, Gosam issued a second edition of that book with a preface that shows that he was completely convinced of the views of Tatyana and Echitka. Um, and as a consequence, he changed the entire presentation of the book. And he changed the title, which was now called Leerbuch der Demstadt. And that is in uh, response to general claim of uh, that thermodynamics is really not a dynamic theory, but mostly a theory of equilibrium perspective. And that therefore, it's much more appropriate to call it thermostatics than thermodynamics. And Holstam was apparently so much impressed by that view that he didn't mind changing the title of it that Van der Waals had mostly written uh, in 1908, but Holstam changed that posthumously. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the starting point of Afan Sheva's approach to thermodynamics was, of course, Theodori's approach of 1909, that was not immediately well known in its community, but it received much more attention. The book uh, wrote a more simple and popular version of that presentation in 1921, and then it became the subject of a extended debate between uh, Boren, Planck, uh, and many others. And, uh, Afanasheva also starts with that approach, uh, and she mostly agrees with the work there, the character theory, uh, that what we call reversal processes and what character theory calls partial static processes are just curves in equilibrium state space that can be described by differential equations in particular exact and not exact differentials, usually called Fafian theory. But she also added two other axioms uh, of her own hand that did not appear to her. And I will give an example in the second part of uh, one of those axioms. In the more expansive work in 1956, uh, she focused on the Tucker theory of thermodynamics, not just the second law. Um, and there she got the Gordian knot of the problem that I pointed out before by actually changing the names of class of reversible processes to quasi processes. That is to highlight that they are simply not meant to be changes that history can go through in the course of time. They are just curves in an equilibrium state space. 
And therefore also, since they're not processed, it's by themselves. The question of whether you can reverse them in the course of time just makes no sense. And reversibility or irreversibility can only be objectives and purposes, but not curves in an equilibrium statement. However, of course, just changing the name is not enough. Um, if you want to connect quasi processes with what actually happens in the uh, you would have to think of them as a limit or a sequence of processes. And I will give an example of how that could apply in the next slide, please. And I made an attempt to draw what I find. This is actually not a category quasi static limit because these are not deformation coordinates. But suppose I would like to heat up the system, which is a small box uh, in the left upper left corner, and it's in contact with heat bath at the initial temperature. And in order to heat it up, I take it out of that heat bath and put it in another heat bath that is slightly higher temperature. If I do so, that will be out of equilibrium. Uh, it's doubtful whether it has a temperature by itself at that stage, but I can let it sit in the next heat path for as long as you wish until it equilibrates with the second heat path and then it will have the temperature of that second heat path. Now you could repeat that by moving the system to another heat path which has an even slightly higher temperature and wait a long time until it equilibrates over there and, and you repeat that in as many steps as you wish until finally you get at the final temperature uh, which is depicted on the far right. Now that is a sequence of processes that you could perform in a laboratory. And if you make a step smaller and put as many of these little steps in the whole sequence, then you can try to approximate uh, a particular uh, equilibrium state space where the system has a constant, a, a definite temperature all the way. Uh, you could also try to think of reversing this process. Well, you actually cannot, because you point out perhaps that it doesn't matter how many steps you have, each of those steps is going to involve the creation of an amount entropy because the system will move from a non equilibrium state to an equilibrium state. And so, in the end, each of the processes is in fact reversible, it is in fact irreversible. But you can also think of another process which I depicted in the low uh, sequence, where you start at the final temperature of the first sequence and then move the system to a reservoir which is slightly cooler. Let it equilibrate over there then move it to another reservoir which has slightly uh, cooler temperature still, let it equilibrate over there, and repeat that as many steps as you like until you get back to the initial temperature. Now that is also a sequence process, this of which you could take a limit, 
And that would move it along the same for magnetic state phase, but now in the first action. So that's the closest you can get to a reversal. Now, how would that look like if I try to depict it in the state space? Uh, and could I have the next slide? Now, this is, again, the admittedly not very well drawing. Um, but this is the way I would like to conceptualize Aparnasheva's uh, approach to the, the, the quasi processes in equilibrium states. So, what I'm trying to draw in the uh, thick wavy line that goes through the middle is the equilibrium state space, which I have now collapsed in a single dimension um, just in order to make the picture more accessible. And on the left, you see a big plot of Fi, which is the initial state of your system. On the right, there is not that of as F, which is the final state of the system. And there's a quasi process, a curve in equilibrium state of it, that starts as I and as F. Now, if you want to take a sequence of reprocesses in order to approximate that curve, you could start out with the uh, dotted line on top, which is you take the system in initial state, disturb it so that its state is no longer in equilibrium state space, but now is outside of that space. And we'll go through maybe quite convoluted and difficult to describe evolutions. There might be uh, turbulence, there might be shock waves, there might be all kinds of things going on in that system. But hopefully, in the end, and if you have disturbed it in the right way, it will settle down at the final state, SS, uh, in the course of time. So that would be the first approximation to the quasi process. Uh, and in the manner that I just sketched on the previous slide, you could try to cut up that step into smaller steps and go to the second series of uh, steps that is now the, the three uh, arcs uh, just below the line. <laughs> and uh, take the system from the initial state to the final state uh, in a series of steps. And if you make the steps smaller and increase the number, you will have a another uh, real process, an irreversible process, by which you can approximate that curve in equilibrium state space uh, in a better and better way. Similarly, you could start out from the final state, and there is a process that will take it to the initial state. That is the lowest uh, dotted line in this figure. Uh, and again, uh, you do that by disturbing the system, so you take it out of the different state space, and that is a very high dimensional state space. It's very hard to give any exact description of it. Uh, but if you do it the right way, hopefully in the end it will settle down back in the initial state of the uh, first mentioned process. Again, you try to approximate that, but at 
sequence of smaller steps and making those steps smaller, 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 you can approximate that very same uh, curve in equilibrium state, the classic process. Now, the important thing to notice here is that any process that I use to approximate the curve uh, is actually a recursive process. Uh, but they both flow the same curve, uh, one time running from the initial state to the final time. In the other case, from the final state back to the initial state. And of course, both those sequences are different processes. None of the, any uh, member of the sequence of the first kind uh, will be exact reversal of any sequence on any member of the second sequence. That's why I draw them from different sides of the equilibrium state. So the question whether that curve in uh, equilibrium state is reversible and whether it can be reversed is strictly meaningless because they can only be approximated by irreversible processes. And so the very objective uh, to call a quasi step quasi process reversible simply loses sense. It's just not a concept that can be applied to those things. They, it, it, again, these curves are orientation, but you cannot revert them in the course of time simply because they're not processes in the course of time. So this is by means of an example how Afanasheva's approach to the problem of referred to processes looks like. Now can I have the slide? to compare that to what, in the end, is the interpretation of uh, reversible processes. It's somewhat remarkable in this, book, in this paper that he, at the same time, tries to argue that the concept is consistent, but also tries to get the, the, the discretization of them. And this is a, uh, a diagram that I borrowed from his picture, where he also shows that there is a sequence of non-equilibrium processes, irreversible, each one of them, that can approximate the curves in an equilibrium space. And you can that from an initial state to a final state, as in the top sequence. Or you can do it from the end state to the end state, which is the lower sequence. Both of them are sequences of irreversible processes that approach the same perfect end But that doesn't change the fact that each of, the, each of those sequences consists of irreversible processes. So you will see the similarity, I hope, between this approach and Theodoris' approach. And although I wasn't able to convince Norton that Theodoris' that, uh, approach is actually the same as the approach that he suggests, um, they are very related, and I think that Norton didn't completely understand it was up. And I don't blame him for it, 
sometimes hard to read. Uh, but this is what I believe the kind of that Dr. Sheba did, and she, I think, clearly uh, preempts a Northern solution, or at least the work is very, very similar to what Norton comes down to in the end. So, can I have the next slide? So, there is, of course, one issue that still remains on the table, and that is we are talking about sequences and processes that and trying to take a limit of the sequence. But in order to do that, we need, of course, some kind of topology, which has to be defined on the non-equilibrium state space. And by use of that topology, we could argue whether a deviation from an equilibrium state and a non-equilibrium state is small or not, and how you could take the limit uh, smaller and smaller deviations. Now that is, of course, a very tricky problem because the microlimit space might be extremely wild, and we have hardly any idea in orthodox dynamics about how to describe it. Um, and Afanasheva also does not address that problem. Norton also doesn't really consider that problem uh, because he adopts the terminology in which he thinks that processes are always driven by what he calls hiving forces. Uh, that is an imbalance in temperature or pressure or something else. But I have to admit that that turned up not quite big for me. In fact, I think the Borco's ideas here that come from the same tradition that he tries to criticize, namely uh, systems that are almost or approximately in equilibrium, because only in those cases was the concept of temperature, of pressure, and similar parameters makes sense. Um, and since, in general, the system might be very far out of equilibrium, uh, it's not clear what would be the right okay, and particularly there not clear what set makes this that the drive force of small or not and take the limit in that way. To take an example, for example, if I have a gas that is in a chamber of a two-chamber container and I punch a hole in the wall so that it would lead into another container, the other chamber. What, in that case, is the driving force that proposes? Is it the hole? And will the driving force become smaller if the size of the hole is smaller? Or is it difference in pressure on both sides? And would the driving force become smaller if the difference in pressure is smaller? Uh, and how do you compare? size of all and the, the difference in pressure. Or to take another similar example, what about the mixing uh, of gases as it is often discussed in Gibbs paradigm? If you take two chambers of same gas and you mix them, then there is no increased entropy, and it's generally not regarded as a process at all. Uh, because the final thermodynamic state is 
the same is only from the next. But if there are gaps are different, then there is an increase of it. Uh, and therefore, there is a thermodynamic process. It's, of course, not a quasi static process, uh, but it's still a process. And the question is then, or at least you could ask, what is the driving force, if there is any, of that process? <coughs> Is it the difference between the two gases? And what sense does it make to say that the difference becomes smaller? I think this is generally not right here, and that the whole idea that processes often take place under the influence of drive forces, and that those forces can always be identified and quantified is not clear to me at all. And so I would argue that Norton's proposal is actually not better uh, than Akhanov's uh, in the sense that also his case, one needs to be much clearer on what it means for a difference which is better and better and better approximately. So, can I have the next slide? So, to summarize what I've been saying so far, uh, I think it's important to realize that the concept of eutrophable process is just not inconsistent, despite of anything that Norton had written about. But it is inconsistent, of course, if you think of it as process. And that's the entire point of kind of shape as uh, renaming it, that it's much better to call them quasi to uh, emphasize that you still think of it as process. Still, I also want to that I think there's an emphasis, uh, there's a difference in emphasis between their two professions. Because it seems to me that Morton uh, is mostly worried about sending personal processes are processed. And therefore it comes up with this claim that they are inconsistent. Avana was also worried about the same concept. But her emphasis was much more on the sense in which you could call them in person, uh, which I try to find out uh, is also is actually a term that also so they're neither reversible nor processes, but there is a conversation of what are called small purposes. And as I also uh, pointed out, there is still a lot of work that remains to be done in characterizing the topology in which to take these limits. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say about that discussion for the moment. Uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, it's quarter after one, and what time are you going to tell me? I'm sorry? Um, what time are we going to? Uh, yeah, so we're, 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 we're going to um, 2.45, so we'll just how much time. We just don't know how much time is left for discussion. Sorry, but yeah, quarter after two, so we have half an hour left in the session? Yeah. In total. Yeah, right. We got half an hour left? In total, yes. That, but that includes discussion. OK, then, uh, well, I'll try to be brief about the second part. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? OK. Um, this is about her 1925 paper, 
in which he considers and also criticizes Kara Theodori's approach to thermodynamics. And I will skip most of the technicalities here, but one of the things that she argues here is that there is a need for additional axioms here, and one of those axioms is something that she formulates as saying there is only a single mode of thermal coupling. And the Haas Lawrence, in her book, puts it slightly differently. Uh, she says, she puts it in a form as there are no thermal levers. Now, at first sight, you might ask yourself, what are they talking about? And what is meant by all of it? And so, if I can have the next slide. Um, the background of all of that is perhaps most easily understood if you compare two uh, differential equations that can be used to characterize uh, reversible processes or cross processes, as she later called them, uh, one with a heat differential and one with a work differential. Both of these equations only make sense uh, in the limits that we have been discussing when you are talking about systems which are close to equilibrium. Now, there is a similarity between those equations. And so you might ask whether you could think of pressure as being in strict analogy temperature, and in fact, whether it would be true, uh, what would happen if you were simply to swap the mean of all the three symbols in the two equations. And also, of course, that changes uh, the term work and heat uh, everywhere where you use them. Um, and you could ask, is that swapping, is that a symmetry of thermodynamics or not? And it turns out, in Karate-Dori's approach, it actually is. So for every theorem that he derives uh, in when you use uh, heat, temperature, and entropy, uh, you could replace all of that by work, pressure, and volume, and you would get equally valid theorem. So that means, uh, if you go to the next slide, that alongside with the second law of thermodynamics, which Carlo Theodori derives the formulation that the entropy is non decreasing in any adiabatic process. Where an adiabatic process, of course, uh, excludes the transmission of heat to the system, there is an equally valid formulation to say that the volume of the system is always non decreasing in any process in which you do not perform work on the system. And if that is so, then you could ask, why does entropy stand out as a measure of irreversibility? And wouldn't it be equally possible to characterize irreversibility in the world by saying that the volume of thermodynamic systems is always increasing in the course of time. Um, and if you think about it a little longer, you will find that it's actually not obvious at all why that second claim would be false. Because gases um, do have a property of uh, expanding adiabatically. Uh, that is, if you don't do work on them. Uh, but it's impossible to compress a gas without doing work on it. Uh, and so, in that sense, there seems to be a very strong similarity between these two things. And you might start to worry why everybody focuses on entropy and nobody talks about the entire universe as, as uh, striving for greater and greater volume. 
Now, the answer to this problem uh, is very well discussed by uh, the Haas Lawrence, as I said, under the direct influence of uh, Afghan And the point is to follow. You can go to the next slide. There is a difference between work and eat in the kind of contractions you can use to exchange them to these systems. So what I'd like to draw in that diagram are two containers um, which are connected or uh, are closed with pistons and these are connected with levers. And initially uh, think of those levers as being locked, they're fixed in position, uh, and shoot that both containers contain capacitance of equal pressure and equal temperature. And if you now ask can I do work, make the first system do work on the second? Uh, you can, and uh, the way to do that is to uh, loosen the lower lever. Because they have equal pressure, uh, the force exerted on the left side will be greater than the force exerted on the right side. And so the lever will start moving, doing work, in this case, on the first system at the expense of energy of the second system. But instead of loosening the lower lever, you could also loosen the upper lever. And then the direction of work will be reversed. In this case, it's the other gas that does work on the first system. So whether one system does work on another system or the other way around depends on the type of mechanical coupling you use to connect them. This, of course, is just not opting out but hydraulic action. If instead of having gases of equal pressure, I have gases in those two containers of different pressure. It's still the case that I can decide whether the high pressure gas does work on the low pressure gas or the other way around. It just depends on the uh, construction you use to connect them. So there is an important distinction between work and heat. And that is that a system with low pressure can very well do work on a system with higher pressure. Whereas with temperature, a system with low temperature cannot transmit heat to a system of higher temperature, which, as you will remember, is Clausius way of flipping second form. So there is a distinction between thermal coupling's and mechanical couplings. Namely, mechanical couplings depend on the device you use, while thermal coupling only can happen in a way that determines the direction of heat flow. And that is why Afanasheva uh, insisted that Paraphyopoly needs additional action uh, in order to remove that symmetry of dynamics, which his formulation would otherwise assess. And I'm not sure about how you think about this, but I have never seen any other text that discusses examples like this at all. And so I think that this is a very original and very insightful insight of Afanashiva. And I wonder why it is not more widely known in thermodynamics. So this is uh, all I want to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to questions. Hi, Els. Hi, Wayne. So um, about this question about the 
state space, which you're going to embed a, a, um, the equilibrium state space in. So like both you and John Norton and, and, and implicitly um, Eric Pesta is, is talking about processes through kind of some kind of state space in which the equilibrium states are only some subset. Yes. How am I to think of that in terms of the microphysics? So um, I can think of two candidates. That um, one is you've got the underlying mechanical state space, so the, the classical mechanics of phase space, and somehow or another the state space we're talking about is some kind of coarse graining of it, or else the st the whole state space. That there, or should I think of the equilibrium states as certain kinds of probability distributions on um, the phase space and then the larger state space in which it's embedded would be this, the, the space of all probability distributions on the um, phase space? That's a good question. Uh, and that's why I said it's, it's very difficult to make progress in that direction. There is a multitude of exceptions that you could use for a description of non equilibrium states. Uh, you can take the statistical mechanical approach uh, in which you have a phase space uh, which contains uh, positions and momenta of, of particles in your system. Uh, and you could also consider the class of all probability distributions on that. Uh, there is also uh, a long-standing tradition uh, to which was a hydrodynamics uh, and describe the system at some continuous medium, uh, but in which you can have all kinds of flows and turbulence and, and uh, non-equilibrium <coughs> situations. There might be sound waves coming through your system that can be described uh, hydrodynamically. Uh, and then equilibrium in space, some subset that's So there is, is really a, uh, a, wi a, a wide variety to choose from in characterizing such a non equilibrium state. And as far as I can tell, uh, the problem of finding such a characterization is very difficult and has hardly been looked at in any philosophical sound manner. Um, precisely because it's not even clear how to coordinate, uh, how to find coordinates for such a space uh, and what its topology might be. And you pointed out there's also another conceptual problem that you might take that either is a phase space in physical mechanics or the class of all probability distributions of things, uh, which will give you another space to consider. Uh, so yes, uh, I personally do not know of a uh, convincing and elegant solution to that problem. Uh, I just think it's very hard uh, to make progress in any reasonable manner here. Rob? Just a, a follow-up on that. Uh, uh, why do you say that if we take the space of all probability distributions, for example, that uh, it's then going to be a challenge to, to define topology and things like that? It, it seems to me we have a lot of mathematical tools for doing exactly that. Like, you know, there are metrics on the space of probability distributions in terms of, you know, statistical distances between probability distributions. So I could certainly define, for example, the notion of a uh, process being weak or a driving force being weak in terms of uh, metrical distances on that space. Oh, yes. Um, so why is that problematic in your view, using that approach? Oh. 
The problem is not that you cannot define the metric or topology of such spaces. The problem is that you can define as many metrics and topologies that you like. Uh, the, que the question is not how to construct one of them. The question is ask asking uh, what is the appropriate metric. Uh, so you can have statistical distances between probability distributions. Uh, recently, there's also been a lot of, of uh, talk about uh, the uh, Earth uh, moveworks distance uh, between probability distributions. Uh, and there are lots of metrics and lots of topologies uh, that mathematicians have uh, come up with. So the, the problem is not that they have not been invented enough. The problem is that they have been so prolific uh, that we don't know how to choose what should be the appropriate one in a principled manner. And, and that's why uh, one typically discusses these problems in terms of examples. Is that answer your question? Well, maybe you could clarify what, what, what could go wrong? Uh, what, what's the problem with this arbitrariness of choice? Uh, are there certain conclusions that would come out differently depending on the choice? What, what do you have in mind exactly? Well, an easy example of what could go wrong um, that I've been thinking, you can, for example, if I try to increase the volume of a gas, um, and I want to do that as, so I, there are several ways in which you could do that. Um, the most often discussed case, if you have a gas, you close it with a piston, and then you slowly uh, expand that piston. And if you do that slowly enough, then sure enough, you will be approximating a reversible process. Uh, and if the uh, gas is isolated, thermally isolated during that process, then it will cool down and uh, work is extracted from the system and phase by losing energy and, uh, and so on. The only way in which you could expand the gas is by making it uh, spontaneously expand into a vacuum by piercing a hole in, in a wall. In that case, it, it does not do work and uh, therefore its energy will not change the process and it's a different type of process. Still, that second type of process could also be approximated by a sequence of intermediary process. One can think of a <coughs> chamber that is divided by a series of membranes. And you first pick a hole in the first membrane so that the gas expands a little. And you wait until it equilibrates over there then here's a hole in the second membrane, so that expands a little bit more, and uh, repeat that in as many steps as you like. Uh, that is also a way to expand the gas to give a final volume, volume. but it's equally uh, irreversible. Uh, as the spontaneous expansion as we've been talking about uh, in, in the first in, uh, just a few minutes ago. And even if you take as many steps as you like and you therefore approximate a uh, quasi process in equilibrium state space, uh, that is going to be a different curve than what you get in the slow quasi-static uh, expansion 
in which you do extract work from the system. So that second limit is very different from the first limit. Uh, so you want to be careful uh, in saying, well, in both of those cases, whether I, I, I slowly move a piston, uh, I am disturbing the system from equilibrium. But that's a very different disturbance from what you get if you just give a little bit more volume to the system by piercing a hole in the membrane. Even though both of those disturbances are small, they have to be treated differently. And so you need a metric that will be uh, sensitive to all these differences that are relevant in discussions like this. And that's why uh, I think that the choice of an appropriate metric uh, is going to be uh, is going to need careful reflection. Uh, and it's not simple and obvious to me how that uh, will pan out. Is that clear? Yes, thanks. Yeah. We have time for one more question, if there's another question. Okay. So, you know, one of your last remarks was that, that this, uh, the work of uh, Tatiana Erfesenyan is not as well known as it should be. Um, one reason is you know, that, that book on the foundations of thermodynamics is not particularly easy to get, at least in North America. I mean, there's no English translation, but um, I know. Yeah, but also it's just not in a lot of libraries. I have a photocopy of the book, but I had to get it from the interlibrary loan, and it came from something like British Columbia or something like that. Um, is it the same in the German-speaking world? Is it? Is it? You know. Um, it, 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 um, uh, there are not just, just not a lot of copies around? Um, I'm not completely familiar with the entire German-speaking world. <laughs> no. I uh, do have a copy myself, but uh, to illustrate your, uh, your point, uh, I got a copy from the library in Utrecht who uh, wanted to get rid of it. Uh, because, uh, well, I can see in the, uh, uh, on the first page that the last time it was uh, actually borrowed by somebody, it's in the 1990s. Uh, it might perhaps have been me. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wasn't used very often, at, at, to say the least, and they uh, uh, dumped it from the collection, and when I found that out, I, of course, uh, gratefully uh, received ownership of that copy. Uh, and it's, uh, well, it's a small publisher, Brill in Leiden. Uh, I don't think it had a lot of circulation. And um, yes, I, I would probably agree with you that it is not well known or studied at all. Uh, and I think that includes uh, it, particularly also the Dutch-speaking world and, and, and the German-speaking world. Um, and another thing that I uh, might want to add, uh, knowing a little bit about it, is that um, I talked, for example, to Nico van Kampen, uh, who was from an older generation in Leiden, where he studied. And he had met uh, Tatjana Abdesheva. Uh, and uh, of course, I asked him uh, how he remembered her and what he thought of her work. And his response was that he remembered uh, her mostly as an old lady who came to all kinds of talks and, and uh, at events in Leiden uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but he mainly thought that she was crazy. <laughs> and, uh, I guess that was a common conception at the, amongst the physicists at the time. Uh, 
And I have to add here that in Van Kampen's opinion, uh, who I, uh, with which I know very well, and he was always extremely sharp at people, but his general opinion was that everybody who took thermodynamics seriously uh, is crazy. Because <laughs> that generation of physicists thought that thermodynamics is just a obsolete theory that uh, has been replaced by statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And anybody who seriously, seriously worries about the foundations of thermodynamics is out of their mind. Uh, and that general approach, uh, to which I might add also, of course, the fact that she was a woman, uh, were certainly not uh, helpful in getting her ideas uh, more uh, attention. In fact, uh, another personal anecdote I might have is that uh, I have been fascinated by uh, her figure and her work for uh, maybe 20 years or so. Uh, but, uh, and I've been talking a little bit some, about her at some occasions, and uh, I have been trying to get my historian colleagues to get, uh, who have been working for all to also do a project on Achana. And the response I got at that time uh, was extremely negative because, and I quote from one of my colleagues, they thought that she was just a woman doing the washings and uh, the laundry for all the interest, and that it was a waste of time to devote any serious historical study to her. And at the same time, um, a few years later, uh, I got a message, a mail from uh, John Stachel and Mara Bella, uh, saying that they were interested in Tatjana and wanted to do some work on her, but that they heard that I had already had done some work on her and they wanted to uh, uh, collaborate. And, uh, well, I said, well, I was very interested in her ideas, but then I'm not a historian, so I can't seriously propose to do historical work. Uh, and I said, well, if you want to go ahead and do some historical work on her, please do so. I want to encourage that. And when I uh, told that to my historian colleague, they were extremely negative once again, and said, you can't let those foreigners get away with our historical figures. <laughs> <laughs> so they were unwilling to devote any study to her work, but they were also extremely jealous uh, if somebody else was trying to do that. Uh, which again uh, explains uh, why she has been so uh, unknown to the general public. Uh, another thing that I might add finally is that uh, uh, we are now in the process uh, together with uh, uh, Lena Tsukovsky uh, and uh, uh, Charlotte Wendell and uh, Ivani Valente to uh, edit a book on her work uh, in which we also try to translate uh, the parts of her uh, German booklet uh, and get several historians uh, to look at her work as well. Um, and not only on thermodynamics, but also uh, her very interesting views on uh, uh, the didactics of mathematics. Um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is that I uh, was wondering at, the, at some point uh, whether she ever had a official position in uh, Leiden at the university. 
as her husband had. And so I asked an historian about that, who is uh, uh, collaborating on this project. And she pointed out that, as what I actually should have known all along, that uh, until the 19, un, until after the, the Second World War, it was actually illegal in the Netherlands for married women to have a paid job, at least with a uh, state organization. And since Havana Shema was married and Ehrenfest had a job, uh, she could not get any position at the university, state university, uh, by legal uh, rules. Uh, and of course that is a, uh, a law, I'm not sure about what it was like in other countries, but there are one of the laws against women, married women in particular, uh, that they couldn't have a paid and recognized position at the university uh, because the general idea was that they would be taking the place of an unemployed man. Uh, and that might also have contributed to the fact that she was not recognized and taken seriously as much as her husband because uh, she all doing this on, uh, on an amateur basis, she didn't have any professional uh, recognition and uh, did not uh, receive a, a salary for the work that she did uh, at all. But let me stop here. All right, let's uh, thank uh, Jos again.